This week's podcast is sponsored by MPB, the simplest and safest way to sell photo and video kit. Free up funds from your kit bag and get paid fast. Find out how much MPB will pay you at mpb.com forward slash sell. Hello and welcome to the Performance Podcast for Monday the 23rd of May. The Movies Podcast, as always, will be following us a little bit later on. This is the Hardware Podcast. And joining me tonight, as always, is Ed Selly. Hi, Ed. Evening, Phil. You all right? Yep, very good, thank you. Uh, doing the news tonight, as always, is Ian Collin. Hi, Ian. Good evening. And talking calibration and all things professional image quality is Julian Scott. Hi, Jules. Good evening. Uh, right, like I say, Movies Podcast coming up at half past eight tonight if you're watching live. Welcome to you if you are watching live. It's great to see you once again. Uh, if you're listening a little bit later on, uh, if it's the audio-only version, then both of these podcasts will be edited together in one long podcast. Uh, so Movies follows the hardware. Um, and of course, the chat window is open tonight as well. So if you are watching live, you want to ask us any questions, uh, then hit us up in the chat window next to the video as it's running live and we will answer those if you're listening a little bit later on in the week and you want to ask questions then it's podcast at avforums.com on the email and we'll come to it the next available podcast uh, we'll answer those questions uh, right so lots to get through tonight there's been a, a big hi-fi show happening mm. um, we've had some product launches that i've been along to and uh, Jules has been calibrating as always, and Ian's been writing the news. So we've got all of that coming up tonight. Um, so very briefly, we're going to go through competitions. Uh, we're then going to go through AV news, uh, hi-fi news. We're covering the Munich show. Uh, they then got a Panasonic OLED launch event. I'll quickly go over that. There is a full video on YouTube uh, that goes into it in quite some detail. We'll skim over the top and tell you uh, the main things to, that you need to know about. Uh, and then also we have Ed's album playlist of the week and we're talking white balance tonight what is white balance and why is it important jules is going to tell you everything and ably to say you demonstrated i was going to say disabled there it's not <laughs> demonstrated by these two tvs behind me um hopefully the webcam can pick that up as mm. well so that's everything we're covering tonight but what have we been up to since the last podcast you guys always want to know this so jules what you been up to? Um, changing bedpans. Um, oh yeah. My wife <laughs> broke her ankle and can't, you know couldn't get out of bed, so I've been learning right. the, the art of changing a bedpan, which is um, fun. Um, aside from that, I've been getting addicted to the uh, Court TV with the Depp Heard going on at the moment. Oh, oh never. no! Oh, oh no. yeah, never. getting withdrawal oh. symptoms. It's getting really hot. <sighs> Yeah, you've just gone down on my expectations. Well, you know, it's just it, well, it is, it is, it's <laughs> gripping, but you wouldn't want it in the UK, I have to say. No, no, we don't want any like that. No, 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 absolutely. No. And besides, that means that you don't get the brilliant court art. I mean, did you see some of the drawings of, um, of uh, Wayne Rooney in the? Um, <laughs> yes. In that, yeah. I mean, uh, one of them, he looked like he would, he'd been dug up near Stonehenge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that's a much more charming way of showing these events, if I'm honest. Very quaint. Yes. Excellent. Uh, Ian, what have you been doing? Uh, hang on, let me guess. Playing video games. Yes. Yeah, I'm watching football. So I'm, I'm nothing if not predictable. But this this time I have been doing them both at the same time. So I'm multitasking. So it's, it's kind of progress. But yeah, it was um obviously the end of season football, still crazy couple of days. Um, then that's also been tied in with uh, the Minecraft project that I've been playing and working on, kind of wrapping up. Um, and actually got a little bit a little bit depressing because this weekend, whilst I was kind of watching the football, I was kind of adding all the, the titles and the headers and stuff to the Minecraft thing. And it made me realise that I'm writing it for obviously a, a teenager, young sort of child audience. And all my kind of go-to headers and gags and puns are all outdated. Yeah. <laughs> like everything. It was like, oh, I can't have that. They won't understand it. Like I was doing a piece on just basically trading in Minecraft, how you can uh, trade goods. And I was coming out, what should I call it? I came up with like swap shop. And it was like, no, kids will never get it. <laughs> no, that. And then it's like, okay, what else should I call it? Happy shopper. I, I are those shops even really still around? I don't know. The kids aren't going to get it. So I had to kind of go through about five or six different things. And it was like, I think I ended up with happy deals. And I thought, yeah, you know, McDonald's is a safe bet. Everyone knows. What it is. <laughs> so yeah, that was about the peak of my weekend. It was just exciting football and tedious headlines. 
Yeah, I, I, I sympathise. Like, periodically, I have to write um, pieces aimed at a Generation Z, as they are in America, and yeah. uh, even even younger than that audiences. And <laughs> ble bless her, the uh, sub I work with at the American publication goes, um, yeah, so some of these references aren't going to work. <laughs> they just really aren't. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. Well, I've, I've been gigging again. Not, not me gigging. I've been going to gigs. Yeah. So um, last week I saw Sarah Millican uh, oh, in Newcastle. Yeah. Yep. Um, very, very good. Very, very funny. Uh -huh. um, rude. It was yeah, it's very blue uh, at the Tyne Theatre. Um, never been in that venue before. Very old-fashioned opera house type theatre building. Um, very impressive. Um, we were in the gods, right up the top in the gods. But it was it was good fun, good laugh. And then on the Saturday night in Newcastle again. I went to see the Divine Comedy live. Um, yeah, they are. Well, I haven't, I, when I say that I, they're good live, I I saw them in 1999. So, I mean, it was a while ago, but they well, were Well, they're still so. good live. They're still very good live. Um, and, and, of course, the full full band there did all the, the greatest hits as well as uh, some of the new stuff that they've been, they've been putting out as well. Uh, nice mixed audience um, in terms of age groups and so on. They, they obviously, they've been around 30 odd years, so... Uh, they appeal to a wide range of different people through different uh, songs and musical styles. That they, that Did you sing along to National Express? Of course, you've got Good. to do that. Yeah, you've Good. got to do that. Yeah. Um, Arse is the size of a small country. You know, yeah. You yeah, can no, kind of beat it's... lyrics like that. So, yeah, really good fun. Um, and uh, that's about it, really. Oh, yes, I moved house. Oh, yeah. How could I time. forget that? Um, so, But you'll be thinking, well, hang on. Phil, you're still in the same office that you're normally in. Well, yes, uh, we're keeping this on for the time being, and I'm still going to be working here. Uh, but in terms of living, I no longer live in this building. Uh, we moved at the weekend. We've gone into what's probably best described as a retirement bungalow, yet neither of us have retired, but it's uh, it suits us and it suits our needs at the minute. So uh, everybody knows how stressful um, moving house is. So, uh, so yeah, it's been a full-on week. Uh, and of course, I, I injured myself, so I couldn't walk for a couple of days, and you know the usual, the usual. As you do. So, Ed, what have you been up to? Um, uh, compared to that, nothing of any note at all. The the only thing I've done different to usual is that I cut down a tree, um, which, as you might imagine, with my standard sort of um, aptitude for practical tasks, um, I didn't destroy anything or injure myself. But that was more a matter of luck or judgment more than, than 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 actual skill. So um, yes, I cut a tree down. I mean, it doesn't make a huge difference to my garden, but I, I think it's no longer going to undermine my house. So I mean, that that was about the most exciting non-work related task that I've attended to since I last spoke to you. Uh, I mean, that's a tragic reflection on my existence. But there we are. <laughs> <laughs> um otherwise the only other thing that is of note regular listeners will, will, will remark on this as being a singular event gentlemen on thursday i am off to the cinema oh um, okay so i mean i figured if you are going to watch top gun 2 i hope it's imax that you oh, yeah i'm watching it on the largest loudest you screen have to do available that. you have to do that it, so it's the I, law yeah, well, this is the thing. I think, you know, it is an event film. It needs to be seen in event settings. So on Thursday, I will be going to the cinema for the first time since Dune. Um, um, yeah, there's no fixed date for when I'll go after that. So, yeah, you know, it's a rare and beautiful moment in my existence. Um, but it's pre-booked seats. I'm sure it will be busy, but I'll just have to rock backwards and forwards and deal with it in my own special way. So, um, yeah, that's that's the the highlights of my existence at this point. Excellent. Well, that's what we've all been up to. Uh, we've given you a rundown of what's coming up tonight, so let's get on with the show. We'll be back in a sec with hardware. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can also make a one-off donation through the Super Chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. So let's start the show with current competitions. What can we win, Ed? It's just the one on the go, but it is a doozy. Uh, you can win the Valencia Single Tuscany Black Cinema Seat worth £1,399.99p. To enter, 
head over to abforums.com forward slash competitions and all competitions, excuse me, are open to eligible AB Forums members resident in the UK. We don't have any previous winners at the moment, but I am sure that there will be some in the fullness of time. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ed. Uh, if you fancy winning that, get yourself uh, entered. Right, let's move on. We've got some AV news to get through. Uh, so let's ho- head over to Ian. Uh, let's do hardware first. So AV hardware, uh, what's in the news? Uh, well, obviously there would be lots of Panasonic talk, but um, yeah. you've more than got that covered. Uh, so a couple of other things that are of interest. Um, Sonos announced the new Ray soundbar. Uh, which comes in at £179, so it's cheaper than the likes of the Arc and its other models. Uh, but subsequently, that means it comes with a few less bells and whistles. So it's kind of one of those interesting payoffs between, you know, whether you're happy to, to pay less and not have things like Dolby Atmos or uh, HDMI and whether you know, whether Sonos can deliver the same high quality that it does in its other products at this cheaper price point. So it'd be quite interesting to see how that pans out. Okay, good stuff. And we've got a review coming up of that. Um, that'll be Simon Lucas's second review for us. So um, if you haven't seen the new reviewers on AV Forums and head over to the, the homepage, there are reviews up there. So John Archer and Simon Lucas have both joined the team recently. Um, great to have them on board. And they're going to be producing a lot of home AV reviews for us in terms of sound bars and speakers and all that kind of goodness. So uh, keep your eyes on the homepage for those new reviews. Uh, anything else? Uh, AV wise, Ian? Um, yeah, LG Display um, showed off their 97 inch OLED X TV at a, an event in California, which unfortunately I couldn't make myself. Um, yeah, whether there's any real need for a 97 inch OLED X TV, um, time will tell. Um, not a great deal more was given about it in terms of the specs or obviously pricing, so we can't divulge too much more. But it does, I mean, it certainly looked the part, quite literally, it's very hard to miss. Yeah, uh, when you see a screen of that size, um, yeah. even if it is from the comfort of my living room rather than being out in sunny California. Um, so, yeah, it was just interesting to see, obviously, because it's LG display rather than LG electronics, who actually adopts it, whether it actually hits the market uh, and just how good the, the OLED X it is, technology it is, is going coming. to be. Uh, it is coming in the lineup this year. Um, it's going to be in one of the models this year. So from LG electronics. So that, that screen is coming. Um, in 97 inches. Whether Dude, you can afford it, it or not. I don't know if it would fit through my door. Yes, it will, Ed. It will fit through a door. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, that's a start. I, I haven't seen your door, so I don't know if it's your <laughs> Oh, yeah. By the way, I live in one of those hobbit houses that Peter Jackson got. No, I don't. <laughs> it's no. It, it, um, yeah. It, it yeah. just it just the logistics of it. And then uh, it's basically a glowing wall, isn't it? Yeah. When it yeah when but it's I mean, the, the thing is. Um, you know, we're moving into the digital age, whether we like it or not, as film fans and so on. Um, projected image is it, it's always an image that I prefer, um, because it is a, a reflected image. It has a certain um appeal to it. It has a certain texture and and so on that you can't get from a direct view TV. Um, but everything's heading for HDR grades now. Directors are actually thinking about you know what it is that they're they're producing and and the different. Um, markets that are open to them. I mean, you've seen a lot more IMAX and so on as well, um, which was considered to be a dead format uh, only 10 years ago. So, um, you know, things are moving on. And if you can get a 97-inch screen that can do a 1,000 nits and uh, give you an HDR image uh, with accurate colour and so on, does that appeal to you, Uh, Jules, or are you old school uh, like myself yeah you know we're probably we're of a similar age aren't we phil um yeah. we have a sort of a nostalgic um feel for projected images and um yeah i, I prefer that i mean and the, the other main issue is that most film content is still you know got a 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio and yeah. the forums are full of people complaining about why why don't films films fill my whole screen you know i bought this big tv and there's great big black bars on them so until they can solve that one, I mean, Philips did try, didn't they, a few years back with their CinemaScope TV? But bless mm. them. I mean, it just ignored the fact that it looked very weird when you were <laughs> watching. <Yeah. laughs> it didn't right, didn't work right for TV. So yeah, um, but, but hey, kudos to them for trying at the time. No, I mean, it, we, we're, yeah. we're in a marketplace now where people just won't take risks like that. So, um, so yeah, I think you'll only see a twenty-one by nine screen. Um, probably gaming monitors is the last. Uh, part of the market where you're going to see that kind of ratio these days i don't think we'll see on a tv again 
just for the reasons you've just said there, Jules, normal TV, you're going to have the black bars at the side rather than at the tops and bottoms. So We should yeah. just film everything in four by three, just to annoy everybody. <laughs> well, That's, you know, you, it, I, I know you just said that in jest, but a lot of these professional cameras and a lot of cameras now, um, people are choosing to use the full sensor and then mask it off or mat it. Yeah often in such a way that um, suits them in terms of aspect ratio and what the, how they want to tell the story. And and in the past, I've, I've, I've scoffed at that, but it's becoming more and more prevalent. And um, one of the cameras that we are going to hopefully start using at AV Forums, a GH6 from Panasonic, um, it's full sensor. It's a micro four thirds, but the full sensor is a 4 by 3 It's a 5.7K sensor. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a... It, everything on there is 10 bit or above. So this is the future that we're heading to and, and people are utilizing that aspect ratio. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see I, I just a like bit more Spider, Justice back. League. Yeah, I, I would not be surprised if we see a little bit more uh, of, of that, um, you know, changing some of the aspect ratios changing and some of us old timers are, are going to have to um, suck it up, I think, uh, when it comes to these younger directors and what they want to what they want to do it's as long as they don't go vertical um i'm, I'm all right with it. i'm all right with artistic intent let's <laughs> put it that way. Ratio. yeah uh, but anyway 97 inch tv um if you could fit it in your room if you could afford it because uh, it's going to be very very expensive to start with um yeah it'll appeal to some i mean panasonic used to do a 150 inch plasma um and but that also was... doubled as a complete heating system for yeah a <laughs> And uh, one former Chelsea owner had three on his yacht. So Which yeah. sank under the weight. Right, so thanks for the AV news. Uh, Ian, what are we doing hi-fi? Well, Munich show has been on, so I'm going to guess we're going to talk about Munich and round it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was the high-end show that I, I keep mispronouncing or miscalling the hi-fi show when <laughs> it, it pretty much is. Um, but yeah, obviously it was a very busy week. Uh, show ran from uh, uh, middle of last week through to the, well, I think it finished over the week, course of the weekend. Yeah, Sunday uh, evening. And obviously not only is it a great showcase event, it's also a very convenient time for people to announce new products. Um, so there's been a lot of stories up on the website. I won't go into all the details now, but I would advise anybody who hasn't been on the site for a, a few days, it'd probably be a good time just to check in because there's a lot of stories. I'll run through some of the just the, the headline products for you now. Um, only in the order that I wrote them, as far as I can recall. Um, Macintosh launched a new MCD 12,000 CD player. Uh, Marantz also reconfirmed its commitment to the CD format with the CD60 player. Um, Astel and Kern announced both a new CanMax digital audio player and some Pathfinder earphones. Focal and Name have teamed up again uh, for a new all-in-one system, um, comprising both of their products. Uh, Sony announced new Link Buds S earphones, uh, while the likes of Audio Technica, TNA, and Clear Audio also showed off new earphones or headsets. Uh, quite an interesting one with Triangle unveiling a new active series of its Boria. Um, yeah, hopefully, they're going to get those in. So, yeah, um, yeah. That, that was an interesting one because I didn't expect it. And the normal Boria is excellent. So, yes, I sent an email when the release came in. And yes, very much so. Yeah, and they did look good. Um, I mean, the only other couple of things I had on my list, uh, iFi Audio gave us a new portable DAC Go Bar, complete with a really excessively shiny gold plate finish to mark the company's 10 year anniversary. Um, that's pretty much all I could point to the likes of Kef LS60 wireless speakers that were announced before all of this that are also worth going onto the website to take a look at. But all in all, very busy week, hi fi wise. So I don't know if you guys, if any of those products stood out for you or you call your eye that you want to have a look at in even more detail such as the triangle speak i've got to say uh, as a market segment the the there is a, a real bounce in the step uh, with a lot of these hi-fi manufacturers at the minute lots of new and interesting products said well that yeah that we've got to be careful here because a lot of them are flush with cash after lockdown and they need to be careful i've been saying this for two years now that they need to be aware that a lot of people brought purchases forward during lockdown and they won't be making those purchases over the next few years yes, yeah. yeah but um nevertheless there was some really good stuff there are some patterns the macintosh and Morant cd players are interesting um what we're seeing is a smaller number of companies really sort of digging back in to optical disc 
because there is still a demand for it. And with a reduced number of people making products, they um, they feel that they can do good numbers with it. Um, so it's going to be interesting to watch these evening years of CD, because if you told me that Macintosh and, as, and uh, Marantz in particular would, would be releasing new players in 2022, I'd have been quite surprised by that. So there is more to come. And we've actually got a CD player review in the tank, ready to go up live on the site. Um, so yeah, uh, there is more, more to give there. Um, other patterns, uh, there is, I need to have, explain this in a way without it sounding either jingoistic or overstating what's going on. But a number of the launches, um, uh, company Fine Audio, whose products we've looked at, uh, announced two ranges of speakers, um, uh, and they're coming back from Chinese production. They are going to be built in the UK. Uh, there was a new Little Mission, the same as uh, same sort of styling as, as the 770. We've just reviewed the 700. That's also going to be built in the UK. Two new Wharfdales that we've built in the UK. Across different markets, high-end hi-fi is coming back to its country of origin. So it's not just a back to the UK thing. It's a back to Europe thing. It's a back to the US thing. It's a back to Japan thing. Um, I don't want to read some great political insight into that. Um, I just think that people are starting to, customers are starting to become more engaged with where their products actually come from. And I do think that people are responding to that. Um, and obviously there was some really, really silly stuff as well. Project has made a really scary looking metal turntable in the shape of the Metallica logo, which looks like it will have a toddler's <laughs> eye out in about... 30 seconds. Um, Vertair, the people that supplied the Christmas extravaganza turntable that I ended up buying, released a new tone arm, not a record player, a tone arm. Gentlemen, how much do you think that tone arm costs? 30 grand. It's a good start. Anyone else? Any, any other takers? It's going to be more than that then, is it? <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm just a good pound 50. I'm going low, just so I'm at the other end of the street. <laughs> just in case like price grand. Is well, it, it sits between Mr. Hinton and Jules. It is forty-three thousand pounds for an arm. So, uh, I mean, there's wow. still there's still some serious stuff breaking cover, and there was some Dan D'Agostino stuff which had lottery price tags as well. That's what Munich is good for. Uh, it was really heartening to see. Um, there was much more stuff than I anticipated. I had made the decision not to go. I do somewhat regret that. I will try not to repeat that mistake next year. Um, but no, it was it was a good outing. There was some some really decent product breaking cover. And there's one last Munich story, which I'm going to cover when I talk about an upcoming review in a couple of minutes as well. Okay. I think that wraps up uh, Munich. Um, so like uh, Ian was saying, if you want any more details, you want to get in depth with this stuff, then all the news stories is up there. Um, you'll find it on the homepage if you uh, click on the editorial and then you can click on Hi-Fi News and that should bring up uh, everything that you're looking for. And uh, once you're in the stories, actually, if you click on the, um, the tag for Munich, it should bring up all the Munich stories that have been tagged as Munich. So there you go. Um, right. Uh, yeah. It, it sounds good whether it, it works that way or not you tell us um right let's move on because ian said uh, there was pan panasonic news there was i went down to london um last week now um on a thursday uh went to the soho hotel which was very nice i uh, felt completely underdressed as always when you go into venues like that um but it was to see the new range um right off the bat what i'm going to say is uh if you've seen the uh, JZ range from last year, um, there is no changes in terms of design. There hasn't been any changes in terms of design um, for the, the last couple of years, certainly three years for the flagship. Uh, the JZ 1500, so it sits underneath the flagship, the flagship being the 2000. Um, again, this year it has no speakers uh, on it, so it doesn't have the Dolby Atmos soundbar, it doesn't have the Dolby Atmos upward firing, but it does have the master OLED Pro panel that the 2000 has. So if you have a home cinema system already, you don't need the Atmos sound system. Uh, the 1500 is a screen for you. And like last year when I tested them, they are identical in terms of picture quality, the 2000 and the 1500. Same panel, same processor, uh, doing exactly the same thing. It's just the sound system's not there. Um, there is one new model this year that we didn't see at this launch event. So it was just the OLED screens that we, we saw at the event. Uh, Pre-production samples, there was a 77-inch 2000, um, which looked very impressive. It also looked 
incredibly heavy. If you've ever lifted a Panasonic um, LZ2000 with those speakers attached to them, um, it's probably the heaviest OLED on the market by some margin. I can only imagine what the 77 inch uh, weighs you know, when you try to lift it. Um, thankfully, it can't come through the door here, so I'll, I'm not going to be um, lifting that one myself on my own, but uh, impressive, impressive screen size. Um, very, very good t looking TV. Uh, the 1500 is probably the one personally that I would go for um, if I was looking for a Panasonic. Um, and again, great picture quality. They've got the new processor on there, which has a few updates in terms of what it will do in terms of upscaling and so on, as well as um, they're now looking at color volume. Uh, obviously, Samsung have released the QD OLED, Sony are going to do a QD OLED. There is no QD OLED from Panasonic this year uh, in the lineup. Um, but yes, uh, they said that they have managed to increase the uh, overall color volume, especially with blue by increasing the uh, uh, gradations that are visible within uh, blue and the color of blue. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to measure up and see exactly what they are doing uh, to try and compete in terms of color volume, which everybody's going to be talking about this year. Um, so that was interesting. There's also the smaller screen sizes. So uh, the screen sizes for the flagship is 5565. 77 you then got 55 65 for the 1500 but you also have 42 and 48 inch but they do not have the master oled panels they do have the wbe panels um so unlike the lg c2 at 42 inch and 40 uh, 42 inch that didn't have it on initial ones uh, the panasonics will have the latest 2022 uh, panels in there that was confirmed at the time uh, during the event um, so if that is of concern to you, then uh, there you go. That's your answer. Um, and then there's the LZ800, which we didn't see. Now, this one is uh, entry-level OLED. Um, that will be interesting to some uh, listeners and viewers. And the LZ980 is the sort of C2 of the Panasonic range. It does everything as a all the features on there it doesn't have the oled uh master oled pro um panel um only the uh i have completely had a brain fart there um oh yeah and the lg 1000 i knew there was one missing that i hadn't mentioned um is a john lewis special in the uk so it is a retailer exclusive um but it does have a master oled panel just not the pro panel so it does have um, some of the uh, heat dissipation technology but not the full um, 1500 and 2000 model uh, versions of that uh, it's still my home screen for smart tv although uh, intriguingly the lower end models especially the led models will be um, android versions so um that was interesting an interesting move uh, why they went that way so in terms of picture quality sam um, panasonic always knock it out of the park they're going to have real competition this year from samsung um with their qd oled which does things very differently um lg have been incredibly accurate this year as well they've fixed some of their issues in terms of uh, just of a black shadow detail retrieval and so on which uh, they have struggled with uh, previously so this year, in terms of TVs, I've seen a few questions come up already. You know, which screen's better than, uh, is this screen better than that screen and so on. It's incredibly difficult to answer that for you and your specific use case. All I can suggest is that you look at our reviews, you watch our videos, uh, you look carefully uh, at what we're saying, and then you take that information and decide which panel suits you best. Because there are questions like, you know, is the Samsung at 65 inches good as a 77 inch G2? Which one would you have at eight feet seating distance? Well, there's a lot of caveats in there. There's a lot of what LG does very well. Uh, and then the Samsung will do other things better and other things worse. So, you know, there is no catch all. There is no perfect TV, which is why, you know, I think um, it's exciting this year. I'm excited to get stuck into these TVs. I've been really enjoying the Samsung and the LG sitting next to each other here. I've been doing a lot of work um, to make sure that we cover absolutely everything that you guys want to know. Um, but yeah, there's lots more coming. Panasonic looks really interesting. They're always accurate. 
Um, it's something that they take very, very seriously. Um, they want to give you the best possible picture quality. They haven't gone QD OLED this year, so it's going to be interesting to see what they have done um, in terms of color volume and what they have done in terms of the panel. And they did take a, a bit of time to actually stress what it's not just the panel, it's the processor on top of that uh, and everything that goes with that. So, um, yeah. Stay tuned is what I'd say, because we're going to have the, the models turn up as soon as they're available. And we're going to start with the 1500, hopefully, which I think is more suited to the AV Forums audience. So that was the Panasonic launch. The video is on our YouTube channel of the launch event. If you want to have a look at shots of the TVs and so on, I've got to say, I'm still not convinced with the round stand. Um, I know some people said, oh, you know, let it go, Phil. It's not a big issue. Um, for me, it just, I don't know, it makes it look cheap. That's just the way I see it. Uh, I see a round stand on a TV and I think of a of a cheap Samsung from eight or nine years ago. It, it just doesn't look right to me. But anyway, you know, everybody's different when it comes to design. Um, you make yourself a DIY cardboard well, it, around it, for it. If it annoyed me that much and I owned one, I'd probably get a Visa stand. You know, you, you can get some really nicely designed stands now that you just use the Visa uh, points on the back of the TV and mm. change the stand. Change it stand up so um yeah that was panasonic any questions jules i know you you no i just sort of con con concur with what you said phil i mean it's always a pleasure to to work with panasonic televisions because from a calibrator's point of view you look at the de's on that and it's like you know point two yeah. or sort of yeah. point one it's like wow i mean yeah. you can't see it there's a difference between you know what's the difference between a delta error of 0 0.1 and 0 0.5 nothing visually but it tickles our fancy as a as a calibrator to see that kind of accuracy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, they're one of the companies that did listen when you know we went to them 2010, 2009, 2010, and and said, look, we need these controls on the TVs, and and we weren't the only people lobbying them at the time, but they listened, and they, every year they've they've improved things. So yeah. it's not going to be a huge jump up this year. It never is with TV manufacturers, but it's going to be. Um, entertaining to see what happens I, I tried to think of a word that wasn't interesting because I, I tend to say interesting a lot on this podcast anyway that's panasonic stuff uh, ed you wanted to discuss mark levinson headphones yes um i sense that there will be some outrage in the comment section when this review does go live um Mark levinson has never made a pair of headphones in the time the company has existed uh so their first pair um is news in itself uh, then also the nature of the headphones themselves is quite surprising. It is a wireless Bluetooth noise cancelling headphone of a type that we have tested many models of over the years. The most salient difference being that where most of those top out at between 350 and 400 pounds, these are yours for 999 pounds, which is, you know, a not inconsequential rise. Um, so I set out to work out if that could possibly be worth it. And the, you know, I won't go into the full details of it because uh, there's something more important to talk about um, in a second. Suffice to say, they are the best wireless headphones I've ever tested. Um, and not, you know, it's not a, a, a tiny margin either. Are they twice as good as the next set? No, of course they're not. That's not, that's not how the law of diminishing returns works um but they did do things that genuinely surprised me um and the nature of their design means that um I, as with all wireless headphones i do test them out and about no matter how preposterously self-conscious i feel doing it um and they're subtle enough that unless you really know what you're looking for you won't clock that someone has a grand's worth of stuff wirelessly attached to their head <laughs> so um it's a gamble that you you will have to make yourself as an owner if you decide to do it or not but i think they can just about get away with it and then also they've largely squared away things like how a product of that price point should feel and how um it should be built in that review I also said this is either going to be some sort of weird technological blind alley that we'll talk about in, you know, nostalgically going, oh, do you remember when Mark Levinson tried to sell these for a grand? Or <laughs> it's going to be the first of a couple of people going, right, let's do it. And one of the stories that we skipped over at Munich 
is T plus A, who some of you will recall, we've reviewed some T plus A headphones and they were yours for just £5,000. Um, they've taken some of that same technology um, into uh, a wireless Bluetooth headphone. And what's more, they haven't come in at £999. They have sailed past the £1,000 barrier. And yes, I have requested a review set because I have a sneaking suspicion these are going to be absolutely sensational. What this is indicative of, we have seen this over and over again, both in hi-fi and in multi-channel and indeed in screens. Once someone makes the jump to going, do you know what, let's see if this works what then follows is either everyone else laughing at them as it bombs or if people going right okay they've done it they clearly think the numbers are going to work we're going to do it too i suspect over the next 12 to 18 months where essentially wireless headphones are topping out as i say at 400 pounds we're now going to see a whole new category of extremely high-end devices um, and in the Mark Levinson review, I remark on the fact that Bluetooth is good enough for this. Nobody felt that high-end headphones weren't worth it when the highest medium we had was CD. We have Bluetooth formats that are up to the job of giving you approximately that much information. So the technology has been available for a while. It's simply a, a, a mental gap, a mental sort of hold up as to whether it was worth doing. So... The review for the Mark Levinson will be going live sometime in the not too distant future. And um, I hope that the T plus A one will follow as soon as I've got um, got got a sample. Um, and I think that this is going to be something that has legs. And I would be fascinated either in the comments here or for those listening later on, if you could feedback that, you know, is there anyone going to stick their hand up and say, yes, my work or travel basis or how I work uh, with other people actually stands up to me justifying a £1,000 or more pair of wireless headphones. Because at the moment, I obviously, you know, all it's going to be is anecdotes, but at the moment, I genuinely have no data as to whether this is a heroic technical effort for no clientele or there genuinely are people out there for these things. Headphones were legs, who would have thought? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's one, yes. There you go. <laughs> No, she's not happy about she's not happy about something, that's for sure. Um anyway, uh, that's the uh, Mark Levinson headphones. Uh, look out for them. Right, we need to move things on very swiftly because we've got to do our calibration uh, chat with Jules. Uh, one of the things that keeps popping up, and I think it's probably one of the most important aspects of uh, image quality uh, when it comes to uh, your TV, is white balance, and it's also one of the most misunderstood um, aspects of the whole thing is what is white balance and why is it important? Well, Jules, mm -hmm. what is it and why is it important? It is the ring to rule them all when it comes to your picture. It has vast implications for what you're seeing. As you say, it's a balance. It's a white balance. And it's a balance of red, green, and blue. When you combine red, green, and blue together, you will get white to some, uh, to some degree. And what kind of white you get depends upon the balance of the red, green, and the blue. So um, stress the blue, you'll get a bluey white, and so on and so forth. Um, so you can have lots of different tints of white, as you'll know if you go down to B&Q and try and find a, a you know, pot of paint. Wife says, go and get me some white paint. And there you are. There's a, uh, you know, there's a whole stack of paint that's all saying it's white, but it's white with an apple tint or whatever. At this, and you can do the same thing with your, your TV as well. You know, if you change that combination of red, green, and blue, you can you can you can do that. And TV manufacturers typically, in their uh, vivid or dynamic modes, will tint their white balance towards blue, because we as humans perceive bluey whites as being brighter. And of course, when you walk into a showroom, they want to catch your eye. Uh, to be the brightest uh, TV you know, in, in the room. That's the one you're going to go and look at. But it's not the white balance that is used within the TV and the movie uh, creative industry. Um, in fact, we use a specific uh, white point, which we call D65, and uh, that has very specific coordinates, XY coordinates, X equals uh, 0.313, Y equals 0.329, um, roughly. Yeah, well, it is 6,500 Kelvins, but that's more of a sort of a, an area than a specific coordinate. So um, the calibrated color temperature or white balance that's used for movie TV production uh, is um, 
also known as midday luminant because it is the color temperature of the midday sun in the Western hemisphere, uh, both direct and diffused in the sky. And so we use that, um, our source of, of natural light coming from the sun as the specific white point to which all movies and TV programs are created. And it's funny, isn't it, that um, some of the comments that you read are uh, on a calibrated image or filmmaking mode or whatever it is, it, it doesn't look natural. Um, it's, <laughs> well, too, it's too yellow. It's yeah. too warm. Yeah. But it's actually based on, you know, the midday sun. The midday it is, sun. Ba exactly. It is based on reality and, and, and looking exactly. natural. Um, the thing is that um, for many years, um, the white point on TVs has been very blue. Yeah. And people don't realize that is the case until mm -hmm. you show them that there's blue and you mention that there's blue and then suddenly people's eyes adjust and yeah, actually I can see the blue uh -huh. and see why. And, and I, I guess that it gives the impression of white being super white, yeah. but it's not a natural white. It's not no. actually how white looks. And yeah. uh, a lot of the feedback that we get is, well, it, you know, your snow looks yellow. Yeah, but actually go out and look at snow and, uh -huh. and the sunlight it looks yellow. It doesn't uh -huh. look blue. Yeah. Draw the sun. Um, it's not blue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it is one of these points. Now, again, uh, and, and you mentioned it in your reply there that, uh -huh. you know, the reason manufacturers have different white points is some of it is cultural. Uh -huh. So certainly uh, in the Far East, in Japan, it's yeah. 9,300 yeah. Kelvin. Yeah. Is, it always has been. They, they like a very blue uh -huh. uh, looking white and and uh, a lot of their tv programs if you've ever seen clips of the tv programs and some of the game shows and so on everything's garish everything's yep. you know larger than life and so on and that has been their approach um so for many years when tvs were coming from there culturally they didn't understand the western preference uh -huh. for d65 and and having uh -huh. a, a warmer white point and that hollywood was producing content and tv uh, studios produce content. They all produce it under the same standards envelope, which says you know, what white should look at like. And I guess because we got all these settings on TVs, Jules, um, the, the main fight is that some of these do look initially to the eye incredibly good. You put this Samsung into the vivid mode or the dynamic, mm. I think they call it. Mm. And I can see why people fall for it. Mm. I really can because it's yeah. bright. It's in your face and things look incredibly sharp and all the rest of it. And it's not until you actually start watching something over a, a length of time that you actually realize, well, actually in, in the highlights there, there's no detail. In somebody's face, you've, you've got no lines up here. You know, they look like plasticine models because of how hard the TV is being pushed to, to look a certain way. So um, again, it's one of these second points that- And of course the, the, the um, um, um... People can test this out by simply taking their color control on their TV down to zero, and you're left with with the luma um, part of the part of the signal, which is the the black and white element to the picture. And um, if you just cycle through your TV's color temperature controls, going from you know warm two, warm one, and so on, forth normal, uh, whatever your TV is, you will see the color temperature of that black and white image shifting. Now then put the color control back on to 50 or whatever it is back to where it was again and do the same thing. And you'll see your colors are changing as well. So because it's the canvas that underlies your color, when you change the tint of the canvas underneath that white, that white balance, you're also fiddling with your colors. So skin tones, when you add blue to them, shift in the direction of pink. Um, you know, so you are, you can't, there's no point fiddling around with color management controls or color controls until you've fixed your white point. Um, and often you find in a well-designed television, if you if you sorted your white point, then your colors automatically ping into the right place and, and, are, and are very accurate. All right, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jules. Mm -hmm. uh, two TVs behind me here, we've got the Samsung S95B, which is a QD OLED. And we've got the LG C2, both of them 65 inch. Um, both of them are set to the filmmaker mode. Now, for anybody uh, interested in filmmaker mode, there are specifications as to what that mode has to be. And it's basically the industry standards. So it has to track D65 white point uh, for SDR and HDR. It has to track uh, 
the ST2084 for HDR. Um, it has to track BT1886 for uh, SDR. Um, and then the various uh, color gamuts associated with those standards as well. So BT2020, DCI-P3 within 2020, and of course Rec709 for HD. Now, these TVs are both set. Um, they should look identical, especially with white. But even on this camera here, which is very low quality um, camera built into my laptop, you can see that white looks different. They both have different mm -hmm. tints. Explain that to our listeners. Uh and is that on axis or just off axis? Uh, let's just do on axis first because there are other shifts even with OLED, but let's just do on axis first. Well, I mean, there are differences obviously in those in those OLED technologies and uh, pixel stack has, has much to do with the way things look tinted. Uh, there are other issues with the way that certain um, uh, OLEDs are. So for example, RGB OLEDs, will look a certain color um, uh, and WOLEDs with the white subpix will also have a different color to them as well. We can call this, there's a, there's a term for, uh, for this, it's called metamerism. Um, so that is when um, you can uh, use your, your, uh, your colorimeters, your, your measuring devices, and they'll measure the same, but they look different. And um, it's an odd phenomenon. And it's to do with the way that the human brain um, perceives them. Um, and so in post-production studios, for example, when we're working with RGB uh, grading monitors, RGB OLED grading monitors, we will apply an offset to that in order to uh, get it to look uh, D65. Um, so there are differences in the way that, the, that certain uh, technologies uh, look um, by design. And we have to somehow try and sort of deal with that when you are in a studio and you've got an LCD monitor and an OLED and RGB OLED, everything's looking very different, but they measure the same. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a challenge to get those to be color matched. Um, so there's, there's a few things feeding into that question, Phil, which is just, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, so um, assuming but, that, but when you, know, you see this and lots yeah, of YouTubers yeah. are doing cyber sides at the minute and putting these videos out and you can see, there are obvious differences. I wanted to cover, cover the, why that is. Even if they're both measured D65, there will be these yep. differences. Yep. Um, and of course, as soon as it, it is a funny phenomenon, because as soon as you move one of them out of the way, uh -huh. you lose the red tint on the yep. Samsung. You move the yep. Samsung out of the way, you lose the cyan tint. You know, your and brain readjusts it. it. Absolutely. The brain is very plastic, very malleable. If you think about your own phone, for example, my, my iPhone has this night mode on it. Everybody does the, you know, the, um, you know, so you don't sort of have the blue light waking you up in the middle of the night. As soon as it goes red, it goes, whoa, you know, it looks horrible. Give it half an hour and it kind of looks normal. Um, so your brain is constantly adjusting to what's in front of you. But where you've got two TVs like you have, that, 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 that difference is constantly being, you're being reminded of it constantly in the same place. Which, as I say, it makes it very difficult calibrating in studios where there are many monitors with different technology types all together in the same place. Um, so it's quite a challenge. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why you should never jump to conclusions when you're doing cyber side comparisons and, and so on as well. You have to yep. take all of this into account. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it comes down to education. It comes down to experience of the person setting up and also explaining to you what's actually going on. Um, so if you see things in videos like that, ask the questions, you know, what were the TV set to? Have they been calibrated correctly? And, uh, you know, have they been made to look uh, similar or are they actually just the measured results? And, and just quickly, you said on axis, off axis, there are yep. differences there. Um, yep. Just quickly, uh, for our listeners, again, I know the answers to these. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you some, some screen time here, but just well, tell us exactly why that is the case. Well, so I think it's down to the, the different the, the, the way that the, the pixels are stacked within within those different display technologies. Um, so um, yeah, they, they they are they are different. Um, and you get that old cyan tint with the with the old uh, with the uh, the WOLEDs, the the LG. Mm -hmm panels um and you get that pinky tink don't you with the sort of the the uh, the newer ones as well so uh, it's just a phenomenon of the way that those those pixels are you know that they're stacked stacked within yeah. the within the device yeah so i thought it was a, a very important to to sort of go down this this channel talking about why people are seeing these differences why it's important and white balance is the most important of them all uh, the grayscale 
Exactly. That is, that is what you build your image on. And if it's off, everything else is off. Um, well, and as I said, with a well-designed TV, if you get your white balance correct, the colors will be correct. And grading monitors don't have color management systems in them. Yeah. Um, and for years, obviously, Sony didn't put theirs in their televisions either. Um, and yeah. the math, it was they were very good. Yeah. Uh, another thing I just want to quickly point out as well, and it's something that I, I bang on about all the time, but James Campbell's just brought up in the comments as well, is that remember, if you're watching a YouTube video, uh, YouTube are putting compression on it. Uh, mm -hmm. The person making the video has obviously put compression on it. And camera sensors pick up things yep. differently as well. Yeah. Um, so again, we're using a really cheap, uh, it's a 1080 mm -hmm. camera, but it's cheap. It's on an Apple uh, uh, laptop and you're looking at these TVs yep. behind me. Um, they look nothing like that in person. Absolutely. So, Again, uh, I have that problem when I'm trying to sort of uh, put to my Facebook page, you know, this is what I calibrated today on my iPhone 13 Pro Max, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, it takes a photograph. It doesn't look anything like that. Yeah. It doesn't look yeah. anything like that yeah. at all. So just bear that in mind when you're watching yeah. video content and so on. Listen to what's actually being explained. That's that's the most important part. Um, right. Okay. So we've covered that. We're doing well for time. So I think we should bring back uh, an area of the podcast uh, to hardware, which we used to do a lot and we've had a lot of feedback um, in comments and so on saying we really miss you guys talking about what you're actually watching uh, on your systems. You guys talk about your systems all the time, but what is it you're actually watching and what, what should we watch? Um, for a TV review, I very rarely watch TV. Huh. <laughs> I watch the same things on on cycles. I, I know what they look like and you know when you're assessing TVs. But it's a big week in TV this week. Uh, especially if you're a sci-fi fan. And I know most of our uh, listeners and viewers are sci-fi fans. I'm really excited for Friday. Um, we have two uh, big series coming. So we have on Disney Plus, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh. Uh, Ewan McGregor back. Uh, anybody excited for this, apart from me? Is he on a motorbike? No. No, that's the other one. I'm <laughs> willing is. to give it a go. Um I, I just, I don't know. Um, I mean, I have to be honest, I found the book of Boba Fett to be fairly disappointing. I did. But... It, it, it basically turned into Mandalorian 2.0, didn't it? Um... Well, yeah, it, it, as I say, I am not. I wasn't convinced by that. I'll give it, I mean, I've got, still got a blooming Disney subscription lurching onwards, yeah, yeah. so yeah, why not? I'll give that a whirl. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, of course, the other one is Stranger Things 4. Well, I never Netflix. watched anything other than halfway through season one so that's All right. really okay. but i have to be honest they are extracting the michael uh, with some of the episode lengths on this they, they just look preposterous the chances of me sitting and watching episodes that long are somewhere between slim and none yeah uh kenobi is anybody else interested in this or am, am i the only one just really really flying like jules yeah, well, I, I, I like Star Wars kind of Good. stuff, but I don't get to watch it because I'm in a household where that kind of thing is not uh, welcome. So right. um, we just end up with some G Judy Dench or something like that in, you know, in some drama. Yeah, but, you know, you've got the demo facility there. You could just say, you know, I'm, I'm off to yep. make sure that this projector's calibrated because I've got a client coming yep. and you could just sit and watch it there. Yeah, right. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And yet he still doesn't. <laughs> Literally take you well, out of video. I did watch The Northman um, the, other, the other night. Oh, right. I saw that was up for rent. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Good. I'll catch that when it's free. Not paying for it. Um, you pay subscriptions anyway. Why, why pay for well, it? Well, it depends I, I, if you I, want to go above and beyond, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it does. I haven't m methodically watched anything since Slow Horses ended. I thought that was absolutely sensational. I can't wait for more than that. Uh, more of that. That's on Apple TV. Um, I did watch quite a few of the Roger Moore era Bond films on Amazon because <laughs> they are included in the subscription. Yeah. And I, those are the Bonds I grew up with. I mean, I'm, as far as I, I don't want real world villains. I want a man with a space station. Can we be very clear about this? This is how Bond films should work. Yeah, um, I, I've finally got round to watching, because uh, obviously the new one's on there uh, as part of Prime now as well. So uh, I finally got round to watching that. Didn't like it? No, I wasn't a fan. Was not. I, I had a I had a lump in my throat at the end. Did you? Mm. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As I say, not enough space stations or submersible battle palaces. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you that's know. what's missing. You know what I mean? Really bad models and all the rest. You know. So, and I, <laughs> I, I obviously, if we're going back to Bond revisiting uh, this Bond revisiting the Aston era, I want the next one to drive a 
semi quality restored Lotus Esprit around, you know, so maybe halfway through the door falls off or, you know, just, just something with a bit of, you know, a bit more sort of 70s chic to what's going on. Not a Citroen CV1. Well, well, you know, that was, I suppose, yeah, you could bring the special attendance vehicles back, but no, I think (laughs) an Esprit with the full turbo motif graphics on there as well. I mean, it's just so tight. Well, I'd say timeless. It is extremely of its moment, but it's magnificent. Um, But no, other than that, I haven't watched I mean, I turn things on and sort of have things glowing whilst I eat food, but I have read more books and listened to more music in the last couple of months than than I have gone anywhere near the television. I mean, you guys will know this off the top of your the, You know when the LG um, OLEDs do that funny wipe thing after a given period of time? Yeah. They do. Um, yeah. Uh, unless you know most people have gone, oh, mine's done like three or four. I mean, I got mine in early 2018 and it's done one. <laughs> so i'm not a high miler when it comes to television stuff so yeah but you knew okay. that ian uh well I, I don't have disney plus so everyone's off the cards for me in the immediate future but i did that thing with star wars where i got like a film behind and then suddenly 20 things came out and i was kind of lost in the, the whole scheme of it same with the the avengers films where i'm I, I wouldn't know where to start to start playing catch well you, you start by getting a disney plus subscription because they're all on there this is what i did uh, the avengers stuff i was completely yeah. out of the, the whole marvel thing i and i sat um two weekends in a row and watched them all in order um so i was completely up to date with that and, and again all the star wars stuff's on there um the only thing yeah. i haven't done is animation the animation stuff i've never gotten around to you know rebels and so on never actually got into i mean there is this tiresome requirement to earn money and socially yeah. interact and stuff like that which kind of puts the damp <laughs> yeah there is completionism that, for television so yeah gotta walk the dog uh right anything you've been watching jules that you want to tell us about before we finish tonight um yeah well it's churchill secret warriors i think i was watching on netflix the other day just okay. got into it you know it's probably some old BBC thing where they get people off the streets and make them into SOE agents, but it's I find it really entertaining, you know. Okay, right? so well, there, um, there you go. There's a recommendation for a, a wet Wednesday afternoon if you're stuck at home. Um, right, so that's what we've been watching. Um, we'll try and watch some stuff. So we so this section, you know, got something to talk about because it looks like not a lot of us. Well, Ed Ed, Ed normally talks about records, and that's what he's going to do right now. Mm to wrap up tonight because we're going to talk about records and vinyls and that kind of thing the vinyl hi-fis. the plural of vinyl is vinyl can we be very clear about this please <laughs> i just thought did no, that just, just, okay. just knock yourself out ed what's what's this week's picks right album of the week is uh smile a light for attracting attention you may not have heard of smile but you've almost certainly heard of tom york um the Radiohead frontman has done a number of solo projects over the years. This is the first one he's done with Johnny Greenwood, who is also from Radiohead. Now, I there's statistically going to be at least some Radiohead fans listening to this during the course of the time this podcast is 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 sort of live as the as the new one. I'm going to say something contentious here. I do quite like Radiohead. Uh, but that doesn't appear to be a tolerable margin for most people. You're supposed to worship Radiohead. Um I personally feel that because they are so determined to be to not repeat an album style each time, this becomes a weight that they cannot shift. This exercise here, a light for attaching attention, is free from that constraint, and it is magnificent. This is absolutely brilliant to listen to, um, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Uh, It's really, really um, beautifully put together. Um, I can't remember the name of the drummer. I'm doing him a disservice. He's not the standard radiohead drummer. There's a far more sort of jazz element to some of the work that's being done here. I have listened to this time and time again. I think it is a genuinely sensational album. The reason it is not the vinyl release of the month is because the vinyl is not available yet. You can order it, but it hasn't turned up. And I couldn't tell you if it is any good from a hole in the ground. So the vinyl release of the month is from the Black Keys. It is uh, called Dropout Boogie. I'm just going to stick it in front very quickly so people watching um the reason why this is the vinyl release of the month one it's a cracking album uh really really good um but it is mastered by one of the uh people who is in the black keys dan Auerbach, has set up his own record label called eagle eye sound uh and they take uh mastering and editing re- really really seriously now 
Um, when you cinema types talk about film grain and things like that, the way that this is recorded, it's not a perfect recording because this music should not be perfectly recorded. It is, um, it, it's a clean-ish recording and it's really very good quality, but it just has enough grubbiness, enough muckiness to sound as it should. And there's some really good tracks on it. I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to it. Both the Smile and the Black Keys albums are obviously available um, on all major streaming services and on CD. But um, if you are looking to buy a record this week, it would be that one for me. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and playlists, because the two albums are very musical, the playlist is not. Um, this is Cobuzz doing some historical stuff. They have a playlist called it, The Pioneers of Electronics. Now, I remind you that early electronic music, you probably wanted to put an asterisk after the word music because it's debatable quite how much fun this is. There's a lot of stuff on here which basically sounds like someone just hitting things with hammers. But without these people, without some of the sounds from the, you know, from the very late 60s onwards, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so it's more of an interesting history lesson than it is something that you want to sing along to. But nevertheless, if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the people that got us to where we are now, it's a really, really good playlist. And I, I, I think it's, it, it's worth maybe not three hours, eight minutes of your time. You don't want to listen to all of it in real time, but it's certainly worth tinkering about with this if you are a Cobus subscriber. That's me. Excellent. Sorry, the dog's just gone mental because there's now a dog barking outside, so she's going absolutely. Anyway, it's time for us to wrap up tonight. Um, very quickly, I have been looking through the questions. Um, there, um, there have been some. I'm going to quickly go through them. So uh, Mark Tallon was asking about Panasonic and Sony. Will they release new 4K Blu-ray players? I very much doubt we'll see uh, any new 4K Blu-ray players coming to market. Um, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. We've, we've kind of reached a plateau with that, and What's in the market is selling in very yep. small numbers. You're not going to see uh, much more. Streaming definitely is uh, is taken over there. Um, very quickly, could do a 21 by 9 rollable LG. Um, the 16 by 9 rollable LG is a hundred thousand um, pounds. I don't see that being Bargasm. very popular. Um, <laughs> maybe in the, the very distant future. Um, I own a Sony A80J. My question to you is the Panasonic OLED better than the A80J? That's the type of question that you just can't answer, unfortunately, because your idea of best is maybe not the same as my idea of best. Oh. And again, it's about um, the finer details of things. So AV, We're going to sit firmly on the fence on that. Yeah, one. AG006, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to put anything into, into that. Read the reviews. Everything's there. Um, read what, what you want into that. Which one fits what you want in terms of a use case and pick that one um there is no thing as a perfect display or or or, or so on so again very very difficult to answer those kind of questions um with any real authority to be honest i can give you a subjective opinion um and i think that was it for tonight's questions uh, from the live chat so thank you very much for taking the time if you have been uh, watching us live if you are listening a little bit later in the week um, and you have a question that you would like to ask us, uh, whether that's uh, watching the video version a bit later or the audio version, then you can send us an email to podcast at avforums.com. Um, we will look at those and we will put them into the next following podcast and answer those. If you are on YouTube, you could go into the, uh, the chat area underneath the comments section and leave your question there. Um, and when we see it, we'll pick it up. And again, next podcast, we'll uh, ask those questions. So in terms of future podcasts, we are back again on the 13th of June uh, for the next Hardware and Movies and then following that the 27th of June. So we're back in June. 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 13th. Yeah, no. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't had much of the weather recently, have we? So anyway, 13th of June, 27th of June. Um, Come and join us again then. Uh, obviously, uh, we've got other podcasts and so on. Um, but my thanks to Ian, Jules, and Ed. Thank you very much, guys. And coming up next, of course, is the Movies Podcast. If you've enjoyed 
this podcast, then please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It does help, so please do do that. There's also another channel. It's called AV Forums Podcast. We take little snippets of these big, long podcasts and we put them out as small, little, short videos uh, so you can get straight to the point and find out exactly what you want to know. So if that's white point, there'll be a video about the white point when it comes to video. Uh, go search that out, AV Forums Podcast. And if you could... We would really appreciate if you could subscribe to that channel and uh, help us get the subscriber numbers up on that channel. It is a new channel, but it's one where we want you to go to uh, if you want anything to do with our podcast. You'll be able to find everything that we talk about, uh, movies, hardware and so on, and reviews and, and all the rest of it. They'll all be on that channel. So uh, go and find that out. Uh, of course, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can bookmark avforums.com for latest reviews, news and video. And of course, if you're listening to us a little bit later in the week, uh, you want to leave us a rating, then please do on any of the services that you use. If they allow you to leave a rating, then please do that. I'm Phil Hinting. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And go join Kaz and the guys for the Movies Podcast at 8.30. Good night.